next we have Forgotten Realms Demon Stone. It's a game set in the Forgotten Realms setting for Dungeons and Dragons. Now, I've never played D&D or any tabletop RPG and I know nothing about these Forgotten Realms. I didn't realise just how many video game series were based in this setting either when I looked it up. Thankfully for me, this one seems to be a standalone game with no link to any other or part of any series, so I don't have to make a massive checklist for the end of this video. What I can say is that this game was the developer Stormfront Studios' next game after the Lord of the Rings of Two Towers game I did back in episode 13, and you could consider this game the proper successor to that, since they never made the Return of the King game. The game opens with narration by Patrick Stewart, one of the game's big selling points, as the Mage Kelburn. He talks about how he used a Demon Stone to seal away two equally dangerous warlords. The first was Goral, leader of the Slard Army, and Sireka of the Gif Yankee. The two were in conflict and whoever won would then ravage the realm, which is why they both had to go but now their seal is weakening and a few villages have already been destroyed. We don't even get a title screen, just put right into the first level. A warrior, Ranek, is travelling along in a forest when suddenly the wind picks up. As he draws his sword, a dragon flies overhead. Ranek gives chase and finds a village in flames. Two orc armies are at war and many villagers have been imprisoned. Ranek runs into gameplay. If you watch my Two Towers video, the gameplay is pretty similar. We have a standard attack, a non-weapon attack to stagger enemies, and projectile attacks which in Ranek's case is a throwing axe. While I'm doing this, fireballs from the dragon are raining down. Once I take out all the orcs, Rannick frees some villagers, but they get under fire from archers, killing the last villager waiting to leave. One points Rannick out to other cages and the barricade keeping me from going that way is destroyed. I have even more orcs to take out. Some take each other out, some get taken out by the dragon. I keep going further and get orcs firing huge crossbows at me. While taking out the next lot, I accidentally cut a catapult and take out some orcs in the background. I reach the next cage and as the villagers beg for help, the dragon shows up and torches them all, along with the orcs near them. I then remember something very important. I haven't checked if subtitles are available. Thankfully they are. How else am I going to figure out how to spell some of these fantasy terms? I take out the next set of the and Ranek spots the woman in a cage. He kills the ox in front of the cage and gives her the chance to break herself out. This is Jai, a half drow, half wood elf. She takes over for the next bit of gameplay. She's a lot faster than Ranek and when enemies are unaware of her presence, she's invisible and has some instant stealth kills. Hard to be stealthy running in between two opposing armies though. Of course, to make up for the speed, her physical attacks are a little weaker than Ranek's. Doesn't matter here though because the dragon takes everyone out. As I run to the next group of enemies, I should point out that the game has a dynamic soundtrack, slightly changing depending on the situation. Sadly, getting hold of all that music is a little tough, and I only have 10 full songs for the soundtrack ranking I'll be doing. As I enter the area, volleys of arrows rain down, but they don't bother me and I fire a catapult back at them. I keep on going through more groups of orcs and even struggle to take on an archer up close somehow. Jai's long range weapon are her throwing knives, she has 10 more than Ranek has axes. I keep moving forward and Jai is about to be filled with arrows before Rannick saves her. While she complains about being rescued, through the portal behind the orcs our third playable character emerges. This is the sorcerer Ilias. As he takes out the first few orcs, Rannick and Jai shout for help with the archers. Ilias fights with his staff and can cast spells for his projectile attack. Since they are magic, he has infinite ammo. To make up for this, he's the slowest character in the game. After taking out the first few archers, a path forward to take out more appears. I keep going downhill, slowly taking out every enemy on the way. The others have made it further on too, but they're still under fire, so I have to use this crossbow to take the orcs out. I follow the cliff around where the others have caught up and help me fight off these orcs. When Ilias checks on them to see if they're hurt, the dragon shows up again. They just barely manage to cross the bridge before the dragon destroys it, leaving them with no choice but to escape into the mines. At the end of the level, kills rallied up for experience and gold. I can use that experience to buy new skills. The party reached level 2. I use that experience to buy Ronick's improved trip combination, a combo for tripping enemies, Will Rush, a combo for pushing enemies back, Improved Critical, a combo for huge damage. Power Attack, a powerful charge attack. Jai's Improved Trip Combination, Bull Rush and Improved Critical. Elisa's Improved Trip Combination, Bull Rush and Flame Arrow, a stronger magic attack. As my money, I buy Jai's Armor Enchantment plus one, Slick to make her harder to detect when in stealth mode, Dagger plus one, Ring of Protection plus one for light deflection, and Armor Enchantment plus two. For Ranek, I buy Armor Enchantment plus one, Sword plus one, and Sword plus two. Ilias gets Staff plus 1, Braces of Armor plus 1, Braces of Armor plus 2, Pearl of Power 1st level for adding a little extra damage to his spells, and Pearl of Power 3rd level. I then continue to Chapter 2, Descent into Gemspark Mine. We get a little more introduction to the cast. Rannick and Jai are basically the same person. Quippy, sad backstory, trust no one, epitome of mid-2000s generic badassness. We learn nothing about Ilias here. From now on, I can switch between the three characters whenever I want to fit my strategy or just how I want to play. I walk a little forward and break open a gate, alerting a group of orcs. There isn't too much variety here. Physical fighters are basically the same regardless of weapon, plus the archers makes a huge group of two enemies. I can knock them into the forge to kill them quicker. When my hero meter is filled up, I can use a super attack to take out many enemies surrounding me at once. Once I take them out, more show up, breaking open a route forward for me. 
I go down this new tunnel when my team bar fills. This lets me use the even stronger team super to take out enemies with even bigger range. After that we get a new enemy, gem spiders. They're quicker to take out than orcs. I cross this bridge and at the end have to take out some archers. Once they're done I have to charge up Elisa's range attack to bring the rest of the bridge down. Behind it was more orcs to take out. I break through a fence and start smashing objects nearby to find portions of heroism that fill my hero bar. Once I take out all the enemies in here, the party go towards a new hole in the wall. A smoke bomb comes through and catches the guys, with Jai hiding behind some rubble. When she wakes, Rannik and Elias are gone, so she goes into the hole herself. This leads into another stealth section. You can see these glints in the darkness on the floor. Standing in here is what lets her become hidden. Stealth killing enemies also gives you hero points. This section is basically a straight line, until Jai finds the other two in a cage. Elias tells Rannik that the reason he came through the portal was because he felt drawn to the mine, as if something needs him there. Jai jumps down and I screw up the first stealth kill, alerting the enemies. I can head back and go into stealth mode and they just give up looking for me no matter how close. At this point it doesn't really help me and I just kill them all normally. She frees the men and her and Rannik quip at each other and I'm sick of it already. They notice the orcs have a makeshift throne room and assume there's a king nearby, so they stand there and wait for more orcs to show. It's like the other fights, but I can knock enemies off this ledge. This goes on for a really long time. After I kill like a million of them, the king shows up. He has his own health bar, a lot of armour and two swords. You can also stun one of your characters. After a bit of damage, he'll retreat outside the playable boundaries of the stage and let some backup fight me instead. He also has his own ground pound that creates a ring of fire. It will cause small lingering damage until the fire dies out. While playing as one character, I can press L2 to have one of the viewers perform a strong attack that will stagger him a little. A few more cycles of beating him up and him retreating and calling for backup later, I get in the last hit. Ilias points out that the king is wearing magic gauntlets of ogre power and since Rannik is the fighter, he gets them. Ilias takes his beads of force and Jai gets a ring of jumping. Minor thing, as I'm typing this script, I can't help but keep typing Rannik's name as Renak, as in the Fire Emblem Sacred Stones character, and I'm doing my own editing with it. Ilias sees something that the others can't, an image of his family crest. Ilias's beads of force can be used with R2 to plant them in the ground and then detonate them. I use them to blow open the gate with the crest. The feeling pulling Ilias here gets stronger. Jai then gets an image that only she can see now, making Ilias realise they were all drawn there. For Jai, pressing R2 allows her to jump. I go up a few platforms and press a switch to remove the gate. This time it's Rannik's turn. He sees the mark of the trolls who wiped out his hometown. Using his gauntlets with R2 will make him punch the ground. It destroys the third gate and some rubble behind it. Opening those gates removed the seal that Kelvin put in place. Gaul, as his body is being put back together, causing his slard to fight us. We all fight with giant hammers, but the strategy for them is no different than for the orcs. This is where the game tells me I can use a finisher on downed enemies with R1. I do have to be more careful with these guys though, as those hammers do quite a bit of damage. But no matter how many I kill, more just get teleported in. Sireka's body fully forms first and she goes in to finish Gaul, but he teleports some back up in front of himself, prompting her to flee. Gaul fully forms and demands his army gets Sireka's sword while the party take that chance to flee themselves. When Ilias fills the others in on who those two were, Jai says they're near Cedarleaf, a wood elf village and that they have to make sure it's safe. Rannik waits until both of them are left before making another quip. Just... shut up. I get my experience in gold, so it's time for shopping. Everyone has reached level 3 now. For Ilias, I buy burning hands to increase the strength of this basic attack, a sleep spell, protection from evil, which reduces damage for everyone, and Mel's acid armor, another upgrade to his projectile attack. Jai gets toughness to increase her maximum health, and acrobatic attack to make her new jump attack stronger. Rannik gets sword focus to increase his sword damage, throwing axe focus, which does the same for his projectiles, and toughness. For item upgrades, Rannik gets armor enchantment plus 2, armor enchantment plus 3, ring of protection plus 1, ring of protection plus 2, and ring of protection plus 3. Ilias gets Braces of Armor plus 3, Staff plus 2, Pain to inflict that status on enemies, and Ring of Protection plus 1. Jai gets Dagger plus 2 and Dagger plus 3. Chapter 3 is Attack at Cedarleaf. The party arrive at Cedarleaf, Jai's former home. Sireka is already there calling her army into the village and ordering them to destroy it. A Wood Elf removes a bridge to solve their progress and Jai tells them to stop her from opening the portal. While her own army tries to fight me, I have to use my projectiles on Sireka. What this tends to mean is me standing still spamming spells as Ilias thanks to his infinite ammo, hoping the enemies would rather fight the other two than me. As her bar depletes, the portal gets smaller, but time spent not attacking her leads to it refilling and the portal growing again. It doesn't take too long to stop her though. Is what I was thinking when I almost emptied her and got ganged up on, allowing it to almost fill in that time. I get so preoccupied trying to take her down that I get my first game over when Ilias is killed. One character dying means automatic failure. You can't skip cutscenes on retry by the way, you'd think by 2004 we'd have this down. This time, I deplete the bar in less than a minute. The slard interrupt the fight and Sireka flees once again to secure higher ground. I now have to chase after her dealing with both armies on the way. This has to be done with Jai as she's the only one who can jump. However, I spent too long fighting the fodder and get killed while climbing. I'm checkpointed here though, so it isn't a huge loss. 
I have to fight this mage, which is a bit of a pain when Jai refuses to interact with platforms properly, and this one archer here is floating. Taking out the enemies here removes the barrier on this house. Jai uses the stone there to bring the bridge back. Jai points out the shelter the villagers will want to reach, but Sireka is stood in the way. Goral appears behind her, stating his intention to take her sword. The two fight, with Goral's spells setting a chunk of the village on fire. I now have to evacuate the villagers into the shelter. I need to keep them safe and myself alive while 55 villagers reach safety. I start by smashing this log just to give them a path. Once this lot is safe, the fire surrounding the next log disappears and I can smash through that. A load of archers teleport in for me this time, followed by Slard. I destroy another log after them and keep going. As I reach these burning houses, 15 villagers are currently safe. Once 19 are safe and I can smash through the next log, we run into Gaul and Serica fighting. Once they take their fight elsewhere, some villagers are stuck in a burning house, unable to leave until the enemy are gone and they can smash the rubble blocking their escape. Freeing them teleports in more enemies and taking them out allows me to cross the bridge. I fight Slard in the background while Sireka and Gaul fight in the foreground. At this point enemies just start pouring by and I'm stuck here fighting them until the remaining 30 something villagers escape. Sireka gets surrounded by Slard and pulls off her signature move, fleeing. The party finish evacuating the villagers just as an angry Gaul lands his final blow on Sealleaf. From a distance, Jai delves into her family history a little, mentioning her father died in the attack. Elias points out that since they set them free, they must be the ones to stop them. He's just seeking counsel from Kelburn, his mentor. The party reached level 4 from this chapter. Jai gets repost, a follow up attack after blocking, dagger finesse to improve her damage, improve toughness to more health, and skill focus high to increase her time undetectable. Ranek gets repost, prone attack so he can fight while getting up from a knockdown, and improved toughness. Ilias gets improved critical, minor globe of invulnerability for improved defences, and poison touch to inflict that status with regular attacks. As for items, Ilias gets braces of armour plus 4, staff plus 3, and amulet of health plus 2. Jai gets armour enchantment plus 3, dagger plus 4, and ring of protection plus 2. Finally, Ranek gets armour enchantment plus 4, and ring of protection plus 4. Chapter 4, The Wizard's Tower. Kelburn explains how the demon stone worked also saying that Gaul was reaching out with his mind to draw the part to him to free him. Ilias brings up that his dad did tell him that nothing good would come of him. I doubt that's what he had in mind. Kelburn brushes over that part and just tells them they need to seal them both away again because just one of them alone is too dangerous. He says that another demon stone can be found in Chult being used by the Yanti for rituals. At that moment, Gaul shows up for vengeance against Kelburn, so he sends him to his portal so they can hurry to Chult. As Gaul and Kelburn fight, the others are blocked from progressing to the portal by more slard. I not only have to kill them, but also knock their ladders down. I keep doing this until the door at the end opens and I can run through. I'm not alone here, some of Kelburn's statues will kill the enemy for me. The tower itself is helping me. I still have to knock down ladders at the windows though, they can't do everything for me. I have some extra options for killing them too, into the fire or off the edge onto the floor below. Once they're all dead, I leave the room and end up back outside again. A slar gets killed by a trap, and the trigger to disarm the traps is down at the other end. Being the only one that can jump over fire, Jai goes alone. It's pretty quick and once I reach the end I go through the door into the bottom floor of the previous room. There's a magic pool here that kills any enemy knocked into it. A couple more minutes of killing and I'm back outside as Jai jumping over the fire to disarm more traps. Only once I reach the mechanism, a slard kills me. I get it next time and go through the next door. Meanwhile Gaul pretty much has Kelvin beat. When he says Justice always wins, we see Gaul go for the final blow, but it cuts back to gameplay. Here I'm on a balcony fighting hammer wielders while others hang back on the opposite balcony throwing axes at me. Another door opens when I kill them all and I run through it. More enemies, but this hallway is filled with statues on both sides, so it could be worse. I still fail though when Jai gets killed. Once again, I get it on the second try and go through the newly opened door. Even more enemies, including more ladders at the windows. This one doesn't take as long as the rest and I go through the next door. Ilias lets us know that the portal is downstairs from here. They find Kelvin's shield guardian, which Ilias animates to fight for them. I just get to go along the bridge, wildly swinging in at everything that thinks have come in close to me. It gets me all the way to the other side before the dragon from chapter 1 swoops by and steals it. A slard chieftain then shows up. His moveset is very similar to the Ark King. Weapon swing, stun moves, but he swaps out corner for backup with a grab and headbutt. He also tends to block more often. I die once when I hang back and try shooting him to death. I kill him on the retry and lose control of Elias while he's opening the portal. I have to keep him safe from the horde of teleporting in slard. Not much to say about this. It's really long. Too long. The portal opens as Gaul destroys the tower, the party just barely escaping. Everyone reached level 5 from that, Ranek gets throwing X specialization for stronger projectiles, Ilias gets prone attack, fireball, another projectile upgrade, and lightning bolt, another further projectile upgrade. Jai gets prone attack, precise shot for improving projectile damage, and Elastray's whirling blades, an upgrade to her basic combos. For items, Jai gets armor enchantment plus 4, dagger plus 5, lesser defending, blade of cutting to make enemies bleed, and poison fang to poison enemies with attacks. 
Granite gets armor enchantment plus 5, sword plus 4, lesser defending, defending, and flaming weapon. Ilias gets braces of armor plus 5, staff plus 4, and amulet of health plus 4. Chapter 5 The Jungles of Chult. The portal takes them into the jungle and the destruction of Kelvin's tower destroys it. Ilias keeps an open mind that Kelvin survived being blown the fuck up. He's interrupted when this thing with tentacle arms attacks me. Thanks to this, I have only two characters for the fight against them. These guys just have a lot of health and take forever to kill. Once they're dead, they help Ilias up and he senses that the Demon Stone is to the east. He also explains that those monsters were mutants bred by the Yarn Tea. As I continue through the jungle, I face more of them, always tending to show up in pairs. Nothing interesting happens here, I just keep fighting them until I reach this door. They knock it open while Ranit comments that they must be above a mill. They get interrupted by spires of varying two bigness dropping from the ceiling. Jai and Ilias get webbed to the wall, leaving Ranik to fight them alone. For about 5 seconds until I cut them free. Seriously though, fuck spiders. I'm glad the sword I'm cutting them with is also made of fire now. I also take to cutting their eggs so more can't spawn. I have to jump up to the high levels of Jai to take out the last of the eggs. At that point, a bigger spider gets involved. Fuck that one too. And when I kill it, another jumps in. Fuck him and all. Once that one's dead, the party doesn't even talk about it. Ilias just explains how he can sense where the demon stone is. They go down a lift, but it's so old it breaks and drops them right into a fight between spiders and mutants. The spiders drag a mutant into the gears and crush it, giving Ranak a new idea for killing. After doing some gear crushing and wiping out this room, the door bursts open to show new mutants with snake bodies. These are much easier to deal with and only die in a couple hits. While I'm dealing with the ones in front of me, I also have to be careful of the ones in the back spitting poison at me. Once they're all dead, Ilias says the stone is in the mountains and they have to cross the river. The party makeshifts the raft across, but a mutant makes Ranak drop the rope, making them drift down the river. As the raft travels, we get mutants on land and climbing up onto the raft attacking me. It will also get caught in a net that I have to cut to keep it moving. After more of these, I pass under a bridge with more mutants spitting at me. This goes on for a while until the raft enters the cave. While Ilias delves into his own personal history for a bit, we see that there's many webs in this cave and more spiders. The raft will get caught on webs until I cut them up and spiders will drop on from the ceiling. That's when the massive spider queen shows up. In terms of giant spiders in games, it's no Xenoblade, and the game has the decency to keep it in the background partially obscured. It hangs back and keeps spitting a paralyzing venom at me, while the smaller big spiders keep dropping on the raft. Of course, it can only be hit by projectiles, and only charged ones, meaning I'm mostly Ilias for this. It's a very simple boss, but it just goes on forever until the final hit knocks it in the river and drowns it. The raft leaves the cave and the party gets off, Ilias saying they're close to the gem. This level gets everyone up to level 7. Ilias gets Magic Circle vs Evil, which increases everyone's defense a little more, Hold, an upgrade on the sleep spell, and Mistress Power, an upgrade for his super attack. Jai gets Circle Kick, a second part to a unarmed attack, Spring Attack, an upgrade over Acrobatic Attack, Knock Down, an improved tripping combo, Improved Bull Rush, and Power Critical, an upgrade over Improved Critical. Ranit gets Sword Specialization for more damage, Tom's Vengeance for a stronger basic combo, Fists of Iron for second part to the unarmed attack, Power Whirlwind Attack to upgrade his super, Dwarf's Toughness for more health, and Giant's Toughness for even more health. For items, Ranit gets Half Blade Armor, Sword plus 5, and Ring of Protection plus 5. Ilias gets Robe of Protection, Staff plus 5, Sonic Burst, and Amulet of Health plus 6. Jai gets Armor Enchantment plus 5, Gem of Contingency to revive her if killed, and Ring of Protection plus 3. Chapter 6, The Yanti Temple. The group arrive, but the temple is highly guarded. The guards are vicious, and if alerted, many will come pouring out. So Jai goes on ahead. I spend ages standing still waiting for this guy to move before I realize it's Ranek. Why do I have to hide and he gets to just stand out in the open? I fail at the first guard, by the way. I was in shadows and he still hits a gong to alert the others. Maybe because the other two were refusing to hide. Ilias had an itchy spell finger the entire time considering lightning was flying about the second he touched that gong. At least it's not an automatic loss and I can just fight them off. And it's not a permanent thing either. Once they're dead, I go back into stealth for the next pair of guards. They still see me while I'm hiding. We are in the early mid-2000s, sticking in stealth sections regardless of whether they worked properly or if they're even enjoyable was all the rage. Then guess what? Third set of guards spots me while hiding. Fourth set too. You can actually see that they only spot me right after I became invisible. That was the last set of them anyway. At the statues here I get jumping and find a secret stash of golden experience. I then head through a door nearby. I get Ranek asking me where I learned my stealth skills. Fuck you too, Ranek. Jai says it was due to being half drow, as nobody would trust her. Ranek then calls the Wood Elves racism, smart. I don't like any of these characters. Ilias is the best and he's still boring. After their conversation, they see one of the Yanti use the Demon Stone to activate a portal. They decide to sneak up and steal a stone, but he notices and creates a barrier, trapping them in this convenient fighting arena. The Yanti aren't affected by the barrier though, they can enter and fall out of it to their deaths as much as they want. 
They can be a bit tough, as at one point I get surrounded and stunlocked by about six of them at once. After a few minutes of tedious fighting, from out the portal emerges Mershark of the Eternal Hunger, the Auntie God. He gains strength from eating living creatures, such as those mutants the Auntie have been breeding. His health bar starts off incomplete and will fill whenever he eats one of the mutants, so I have to kill them before they can leave the barrier. Any time not spent eating, his health very slowly drains. So really, it's no different than any other big brawl I've had so far. After a while, more Yanti archers also show up, but their presence doesn't really mean anything, as the mutants all die really quick and never get near Mushark. One long, tedious way later, a Mushark gets so hungry and impatient that he eats the Yanti that summoned him. His death removes the barrier around the arena, but there's still a shield around the demon stone that needs breaking. Mushark's health is now back at three quarters, and there's a second bar in the lower right corner for the shield. So now I have to fight off both types of enemy while whacking away at the shield and avoiding getting punched by Mushark. Best way to damage it is with Ranix Gauntlets. It still takes a while thanks to having to retreat and kill more enemies for health. And every time I run back to the shield after fighting, Jai keeps repeating the same line telling me to use the gauntlets. I get that last hit in and take the stone, removing the portal and making Mershark fall to his death. It seems his wings were just for sure. Next part of the plan is figuring out how to find Gaul and Sereka. Ilias has no idea where Gaul would be but thinks Sereka would be in the Underdark, as the Githyanki once controlled it. Ilias knows a tracker named Drizzt who could help him. He lives at Mithril Hall near Rannick's old hometown. Everyone got brought up to level 8 from this chapter. Jai gets skill focus move silently to make her shitty self last longer, improved riposte and dwarf's toughness. Rannick gets dragon's toughness for even more health and power critical. Ilias gets cone of cold, an ice spell, and ghoul touch which improves the poison touch. For items, Ilias gets robe of blending for higher defense, gem of contingency, ring of protection plus 2, and pearl of power 5th level. Jai gets Silent Moves for better shitty self, Lever Armor, Studded Lever Armor, Snake Bite for Poison Weapons, and Throwing Knife plus one. Ranek gets Gem of Contingency, Ice Burst Weapon as an upgrade of the Frost Weapon, Throwing Axe plus one, Throwing Axe plus two, and Throwing Axe plus three. Chapter seven, Stand at Mithril Hall. The party are already there talking to Drizzt. He talks with Jai about being drow for a bit until a messenger runs in, warning of a clan of trolls marching on them. They raise the stairs and seal the gates, but trolls are already climbing up the walls. Rannick recognises them as the ones who destroyed his home. Trolls are tough. They take a shitload of hits to bring down, and as Rid says after the first one I defeat, they can only be killed with fire. A troll casts some kind of spell that dispels our magic, so no magic fire weapons for us. This leaves me with no choice but to light my weapons on burning coals dotted around the place. Even with fire, one of these takes a while to kill. After killing two, I'm told to defend the tower and a life bar for the gate's gears show up. Trolls keep running up to the gears and punching the shit out of them. So there's a few minutes of running between these damaged sponges and the coals to set my weapons on fire again. One long fight later, I'm taking control of Drizzt for a bit and defending the door itself alone against more trolls. Thankfully, Drizzt feels a little better than the main cast. Maybe it's just me, but his attack animation seems to have more range, so I'm setting groups on fire quicker. Thanks to that, killing this lot takes less time. Another troll shows up and starts lobbing huge rocks at the door, so I have to run over to them and take them out. Watching them unable to move as I wipe them out makes me wish I could keep Drizzt for the rest of the game. Once they're dead, the gate of the North Tower begins to open. We need to jam the gears to keep it shut. A dwarf makes a run for the gears and I have to keep him alive on his way there. It's not very hard, but it doesn't help that even when he's right next to the gears, he ignores them to try helping me out with the troll I'm already handling. Once he's done with the gear, I have to get back to the gate and protect it again. Of course, there's a build-up of trolls blocking my way back. After I get back, it's just a few more minutes repeating what I was doing before until the first gate further down breaks open. Grizz jumps down and I have to protect the same gate I already was, but at the other side. Absolutely nothing new here, really. More tedious fighting later, and the door's health is incredibly low just in time for another cutscene. The trolls have brought in a catapult, leading to Jai and Rannick jumping down to help. Not that I want to play as them, but I have no choice but to use Rannick's gauntlets to destroy the catapult. It isn't enough though, the door's health empties, allowing them to invade. I'm checkpointed at the beginning of this section before the catapult. It gets quite hard to destroy the catapult, since it takes multiple hits, and the gauntlet animation is so long it's easily interrupted by a troll giving him a little kick. But I manage it. I take out all of the catapult segments. The clan's king then shows up. Rannick claims him by immediately swapping off a Drizzt because he's just better and I don't care about Rannick's revenge. The troll king can be a pain because he can heal himself if he grabs you. That includes if he grabs a character you aren't playing as. So I just hang back for a bit using projectiles on him while he's distracted with the others. I end up playing as Jai for most of this because for some reason he just isn't interested in fighting her. This lets me slowly plink his health away until he's dead. I can't rob Rannick of his revenge and he gets the kill in the cutscene. Driz gives the party directions to an abandoned Githyanki outpost and stays behind because life isn't fair. He also gives Jai a charm forged by wood elves. This necklace now makes it so that Jai no longer automatically becomes visible attacking an enemy in stealth mode. The party is now at level 9. Rannick learns improved power attack, knockdown and improved bull rush. 
Alias learns Otulica's Freezing Sphere, an upgrade on the Cone of Cold. Jai learns Improved Prone Attack and Stealthy. For items, Jai gets Elven Chain Armor, Armor of Shadows and Amulet of Health plus 2. Granite gets Plate Armor, Mithril Plate Armor, Belt of Giant Strength to upgrade his Gauntlet Attack, Amulet of Health plus 2 and Amulet of Health plus 4. Elias gets Robe of Scintillating Colors, Robe of Arch Magi and Pearl of Power 7th level. Chapter 8, Into the Underdark. Turns out the place isn't as abandoned as they thought. Sereka has started opening the portal for her army, so they're running out of time. Since it's so dark, I have to do another stealth section as Jai. At this point I don't care about stealth anymore and just get to killing. I fight my way out to the next area where the path forward is being blocked by an ice barrier created by warlocks. I first have to kill all warlocks which takes a while with the other enemies getting in my way. When all four are dead, I can start smashing up the ice. Still takes a while thanks to more enemies interrupting. Kind of annoying when the ice is at knee height and I still can't just climb over it. Take too long and more warlocks show up to restore the ice's health. So the simple objective of smashing up some ice takes about 10 minutes. I go through the door I've opened up and through some more hallways to be attacked by Morgif Yankee. You may notice I'm really skimming over these fights now. There is just nothing left to say. After them we spot Sireka working on that portal. She gets on top and lets the portal bring in Morgif Yankee do the work for her. She's being shielded by four warlocks, two on either side of the portal. They're also behind an invisible wall which means needing to use projectiles, which means it's a pain when I'm being swarmed. You just have to beg for a team attack to clear things out a bit. When the last one is killed, Sireka's shield is gone and her health bar is on display. She doesn't get down from the portal though, so it's another projectile war. And after a bit, more warlocks turn up to put the shield back up. Thankfully, only one shows up at a time, so I'm not stuck slogging through killing another four. Still takes forever though, and I fail when Jai dies. Next time I reduce her to half health, which triggers a cutscene. With her shield down, they try to close in on her, only for the Salad to teleport in, along with Gaul. As he and Sireka fight, Ilias gets out the Demon Stone. I lose control of Ilias and have to keep him safe from the enemies as the bar in the corner fills. Taking damage from enemies slightly depletes the bar, which becomes a pain when there are a thousand enemies crowded around him. Once the bar fills, Gaul begins to notice the effects of the Demon Stone, so he throws Sireka into the portal and escapes himself. The party risk following Sireka into the portal. Pi reaches level 10. Ilias learns Power Word Kill, another projectile upgrade, and Hold Monster, an upgrade on Hold. Jai learns Lolf's Venom, an upgrade to a super, two weapon fighting for a damage boost, and O'Hare runs Shadow, a shitty self upgrade. Ranek gets improved repost. For items, Ranek gets Lightning Brand to electrify his sword and Belt of Greater Giant Strength. Ilias gets Agony, an upgrade on Wounding, Ring of Protection plus 3 and Ring of Protection plus 4. I forget to buy new items for Jai. Chapter 9, The Dragon's Lair. The party land there and the dragon from earlier shows up in seconds. Sireka shows up and gets in the fight with it, which is a problem. The stone will only work on both of them at once, so if she dies, it's useless. So we have to reach them. I get some slard teleporting in, but I can knock them off the edges to make it quicker. I actually die in less than a minute somehow. I don't do that next time and keep fighting my way forward. We get to this door and go through. The doorway at the other side is blocked by fire until I kill all the enemies to make it disappear. The next room has a single enemy we all trap in the corner and bully to death. The next exit puts us on a bridge outside. I need to use Ranek to smash through the rubble here. The dragon and Sireka have also brought their fight here. The tower at the end has archers and requires Ranek to smash open the door. We make it through the tower just in time to see Sireka get flamed by the dragon, causing her to flee from life. While everyone is all down because things are fucked now, I can't help but notice Ranek's bangs look like spider legs. Ranek takes her sword and sees that the dragon fears it. I then continue fighting my way across this bridge, avoiding fire from the dragon. I get inside and run through another hallway. Ilya says he can sense a portal ahead. I get blocked off by more flames and have to kill more enemies to continue. Ilias gets to unlock to death here. I deal with them next time. In the hall of this leads to, Ilias says the portal is at the end of it, but I have more flames blocking me that can only be extinguished from clearing entire waves of slard. It takes about 3 or 4 minutes to open up the exit. More spawning in the next room for me to take out before going through the next few rooms leading to the bridge above lava. The ruin surrounding the dragon's gold is the portal, but the dragon himself shows up again. The dragon hangs out on rocks in the background spitting fire at me while slard keep teleporting in to slow me down. As usual with a lot of bosses in this game, Slowly plinking away health with projectiles is the answer. I don't get much done before I'm killed. Remember that moment I mentioned in the previous video on 40 Winks, where you just drop the optimism and admit to yourself that you just don't like a game? I was starting to feel it with the end of the previous level, but here is where I finally did it. This boss fight encapsulates the tedium almost this entire game has been. Especially when you spend like 6 or 7 minutes projectile spamming, slowly getting this boss to the last little bit of life, only to die right then. In the end, it takes me half an hour of throwing shit at the dragon to finish it. It falls into the lava and Ilias goes to open the portal. The dragon isn't dead though and chases them out the way they came, blocking the way back to the portal. 
After how long the last phase took, I was just tired and wanted the level to end so I could go to sleep. Stay too close to the dragon for too long, he'll MK for Liu Kang Fatality, yeah. But this fight is just much more merciful since I can do actual damage and there aren't other enemies slowing it down. Well, until he hides back, puts up a flame barrier and makes me fight some before he gets back in close. He even slowly heals while he's behind the barrier. So despite being more merciful, it's just as tedious and after 7 or so minutes, I die again. I'm on this phase for another half an hour before I fully drain his health. I have to use Ilias to daze him, Jai to jump on his head to lower it, and then have Rannik stab him in the neck to finish him off. Even three years later, that was frustrating to watch back for the script. I'm actually really fucking exhausted even watching it. They talk about where they might find Gaul, and Ilias believes it would be where they found him in the Gen Spark mine. Now for upgrades. Ilias learns Fire Shield, Mage Globe of Invulnerability, and Mistress Light, another super upgrade. Jai learns Rising Moon, a prone attack upgrade, improved two weapon fighting, and improved dwarf toughness. Rannik learns Improved Rising Attack and Titan's Toughness. For items, Ilias gets Brooch of Wind Wall for better projectile defence, Pearl of Power 9th level, Amulet of Health plus 8, and Ring of Protection plus 5. Jai gets Stealth, Throwing Knife plus 2, Throwing Knife plus 3, Defending, Greater Defending, Charm of Lolf for increased jumping attack damage, Amulet of Health plus 4, Ring of Protection plus 4, and Abyssal Sheath for increasing Throwing Knife capacity. Rannik gets Red Dragon Scale Plate Armor and Ring of Regeneration for automatic slow healing. Finally, Chapter 10, The Lord of Chaos. Back in the mine, the three just jump straight into battle. This is the room we fought the Orc King and got our special items. Nothing left to say about fighting, so let's get through it as quick as possible. Kill all the slats, remove the barrier, and move forward. There's a red glow that Ilias points out as a tearing reality that leads to Limbo. But first, I have another three minutes of enemies. After chatting about how they must stop Gaul, they all run in. Gaul is waiting for them, and he wants the Silver Sword of the Gift that we took from Sireka because it will help him conquer Faerun quicker. I think this is the first time I've brought up the name of this realm. Gaul can swing his own sword, block, and teleport and attack. Right now he's quite easy, just let one of the others distract him and whack him from behind. After enough damage, he'll teleport away to heal, leaving me to deal with these same slard whores we've been hiding since chapter 2. I'm so sick of these guys. Gaul will even get involved again before all the enemies are killed, which, thanks to the wearing down from the slard, lets him get the final blow on me. Yep, it's another long one, and I just keep dying. I get sick of seeing this one bit of cutscene I can't skip. Just the way he's animated here pisses me off. On my 10th attempt, I reduce him to half health. He tries to talk them down and tells them what they already know about how he drew them to him and how he specifically exploited their loneliness. Somehow, Gaul tries to pass this off as being the only one who cared about them and thinks that'll make them give him the sword. They go into their not alone anymore speech and Rannik has some more off-putting animation. The fight continues. Now, when Gaul hides in the back, he'll throw spells at me. But that's about it and I have another 8 or so minutes of repeating this same boring cycle until I win. Drees would have done this in a third the time. Gaul starts screaming in pain as Limbo explodes around him and the party flee the way they came. They return to see the leaf to help out with the restoration. Also, Patrick Stewart is still alive. He shows up bringing thanks from the king of the neighbouring realm and tells how everyone knows what they did. The king also just gave them some wild land no one else wants for them to rule over. He also warns them that Gifyanki will be after them for the silver sword and the party are all just, yeah, whatever. What then follows is one of the slowest and longest credit sequences I've ever seen. This did not need to be 20 minutes long. After the credits, it's time for upgrades. Rannik is already finished with skills, Ilias learns Meteor Swarm, which will never be used, and Jai has already learned all of her skills. For items, Jai gets the incredibly expensive Ring of Regeneration and Ring of Protection plus 5. Rannik is done with items already, and Ilias finishes off with Ring of Regeneration. Just needs some more gold for Jai. One level playthrough gets me the gold for Brooch of Elven Kind and Brooch of Lolf. That's all characters fully upgraded. There's also some concept art that can be used for each chapter you've beaten. And that's Forgotten Realms Demon Stone. If you saw my first video ever, you may remember something I said in my introduction. There will probably be many times where you could say I ranked a game higher or lower than it deserved. In fact, there will be at least one time where I rank a game lower than some even worse games because I hated that first one so much more. I was specifically referring to this game. I would not say that this game is worse made than Street Fighter 1, Super Butoh, NBCV, or 40 Winks. However, I disliked it more than all of them. I just had no fun with this game. Combat was boring and went on forever. Bosses were even more boring and went on forever, and I hated two thirds of the main cast and thought the other was boring. This game took the two towers and amplified all its flaws. Maybe if I was into d and I'd be able to get something out of this game, but I'm not, so I don't. Least favourite game in a bonus episode, only avoids being bottom because of a certain trio of bad parts I've played since then.